Well, thank you, everyone, and, and welcome to the JAX Chamber webinar series. Um, this is an, another installment of our Working Together, Working Through this, Your Forward Together series. And today we're going to talk about remaining an employer of choice in challenging times. Uh, we've talked about a lot of different HR related issues over the past several Tuesdays, and, and this one is trying to make sure that your, your, employ, your place of employment is a place where people want to work. And a lot of that is you know, managing burnout, a lot of that is employee benefits, and so we have some speakers here today that are going to really share that with us and kind of what they've seen from a consulting um, standpoint and also what some of the larger employers are doing. So um, our first speaker is, is Dr. Dick Daniels. He is Vice President of Consulting Services and an ICF Certified Executive Coach with Wright Management's Florida and Caribbean region. He's a leadership development strategist. Um, he hosts the Leadership Development Group on LinkedIn with 28,000 global leadership practitioners and is author of three books. He's going to talk to us today about professional, uh, about navigating employee burnout and then about how to do professional development well, with a lack of resources. We also have um, Keith Collison. He's a senior director of Total Rewards for Florida Blue and its subsidiaries. And also, Cheryl Magavero, who is a senior director of acquisition, also with Florida Blue. They're going to speak together and talk a lot about um, driving for inclusion when working remotely and offering benefits and wellness that work during a pandemic. So first of all, um, Dick, I'm going to kick it over to you. And then everyone, just please be aware we are going to try and get to questions from the audience in the last 10 to 15 minutes. If you could submit a question in the questions tab, uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can. So um, Dr. Daniels, I'll kick it over to you. Hey, thank you so much. And uh, I'm gonna cover some uh, detail of material. And if uh, you don't catch everything the first time through, uh, they will make the PowerPoint available to you to pick up some of the particulars. But, you know, I just thinking this morning, we're coming off a national holiday and a three day weekend, and now to return to work and talk about employee burnout, we should all be refreshed and all that, but there are a lot of things that do uh, contribute to employee burnout, and I think we can address some things that will kind of help, uh, you know, think those through in terms of what our options are to maybe min minimize some of that. You know, burnout from COVID-19 is pretty obvious. Uh, if we're back at work, either virtually or on site, we realize that some of our team members are terminated or furloughed with maybe not a definite time to return. So, you know, it, it does have a way of impacting our work experience with a new reality. And sometimes uh, that creates the stress of wondering what else is coming and might my job be, you know, in question, you know, as we go through. But in addition to COVID-19 things, the whole area of bandwidth, and I'm hearing this phrase mentioned a lot, um, the expectation to do more with less, and people have that sense of at some point I'm going to get to the end of my bandwidth and um, and maybe just that thought of struggling with all that you know contributes to uh, that move towards uh, burnout in the workplace. Sometimes it comes from overuse of competence uh, when our strengths have a shadow side to them uh, and we realize in using our strengths that sometimes uh, we, as we overuse them um, the results can be more detrimental than productive. Another area can be working out of our non-strength areas when the balance is, is out of whack. And we realize, man, I'm spending more time doing things I'm really not equipped or prepared to do or have uh, the skills to do. And, and when that continues indefinitely, it certainly pushes us towards workplace burnout. And the last I would mention is the inability or unwillingness to delegate not handing off what someone else at a lower level could do. And as a result, not only are you doing some of that work uh, from the lower level of employment, but you're adding the expectations, you know, of leading at more complex levels of, you know, organizational um, work and uh, that stress, uh, the burning the candles at both end can lead towards, uh, again, that sense of stress and burnout in the workplace. And so there's a, a couple ways that we can respond. Uh, and one is represented by this picture, you know, of, of thinking at points when all of those kinds of issues 
you know, push us towards uh, the stress and struggle and thoughts of burnout in the workplace. Um, of thinking, boy, I'm at a dead end, I'm without options, I'm stopped and I'm stuck. But our challenge in this session is to talk about how to navigate burnout. And so there's a, a much different way to respond uh, to those factors that you know create burnout for us. And it's thinking of maybe our work as uh, on the highway and we're stopped at the toll booth unless we have sun pass and then we can just drive on through, but we still have some accountability to the state when we pass that toll booth. And so it's, it's in essence, in essence um, thinking of our career as those moments when we stop or we pay what's due, and then we continue on to our next de uh, destination. And what I like to have us do is keep that picture of the toll booth in mind rather than the dead end road and think about how do we pay the tolls and move on in spite of the things that create stress and burnout for us. And I wanna think from a couple of perspectives in what I have to say. One is more on the individual level of the topic, and the second really looks at this through the lens of the organization as a whole. So from the individual standpoint, when we think about burnout, um, I always go to the work that Patrick Lencioni has done at the table group, probably best known for his book, uh, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. But he's done a lot of writing and, uh, you know, concluding uh, this idea of the three signs of a miserable job, irrelevance, immeasurement, and anonymity, you know, when, that there, when there's that prolonged job misery resulting from these three areas, it, it certainly leads us to burnout. The anonymity is uh, people cannot be fulfilled in their work if they're not known, understood, and appreciated for their unique qualities by someone in authority. Um, everyone, in terms of irrelevance, everyone needs to know that their job matters and is appreciated to someone, to anyone. And then the uh, immeasurement, everyone needs to be able to gauge their progress and level of contribution for themselves. And, and so when we think about resolving that, it's a matter of, of addressing those and saying, you know, we need, to, we need to help all of our people in leadership, our supervisors, our managers, our leaders, admit that these, you know, signs of a miserable job do exist and they vary by day and they vary by team member. And, and they need to be addressed in terms of, uh, you know, helping people navigate through there are seasons of burnout, you know, again, that we may be in the middle of right now with the complexities of COVID-19. And so um, paying the tolls is not just resolving the root causes of burnout, acknowledging that they exist, but in light of those, it's over communicating, you know, to those three levels of leadership, our supervisors, our managers, and our leaders, helping them understand, you know, the three signs of a miserable job and realize that None of these are rocket science. They're not difficult to understand. They're not complicated to explain. And, and they're not at all costly to address in terms of really, uh, you know, going through each, each area, the ir irrelevance, you know, helping people know that what they do matters. It's some, some, uh, some, saying something as simple as, Jane, the work you do in analyzing the data about our competition and giving us that intelligence you know, really helps us strategize how we play in the marketplace and we couldn't do it without you. Or in the immeasurement, how their success is defined, being able to say, Bill, you know, I need to have you just do a draft, a first draft, a simple draft, maybe four or five ideas in terms of the proposal for our customer. And I don't want you to go into detail, but I just want you to kind of capture what are those four or five key parts to the proposal and then let's meet and go through it and then we'll work on the more detailed draft that follows. Bill knows the specifics of you know what success looks like in that next assignment or in the anonymity who they are is personalized of being able to say uh, Jose I just heard that your dad had uh, open heart surgery last week How, how's your dad doing how's your mom doing and if there's anything that we can do that I can do to be of help to you in helping your family you know, let me know because we want to be there and support you as your family goes through that challenge. So none of these are difficult to address, um, but they reflect the individual side of um, how we pay tolls and move on. 
you know, by resolving the root causes, by over communicating in these three areas, the irrelevance, the immeasurement and the anonymity. And then if we look at the organizational side, we pay tolls to move on by reigniting the values that define your culture. Values really shape the culture of your organization. And we can talk about it in terms of culture as the ideal through the lens of those values. And we can describe climate as that daily reality of, you know, how consistently are we living out those values in our departments, in our teams, with each, you know, each employee that's a part of the company. And what comes out as, as a result of analyzing or think about that, thinking about that is there is often, probably on a momentary basis, a gap that exists that varies you know, by the day, by the moment, between the culture, the ideal, and the climate, the reality of that ideal. And if we add to that some ideas about values, values are not ideas to believe, but they're really behaviors to live. And values describe the quality of interpersonal relationships and how work gets done, uh, how we work with other employees, how we work with our vendors, how we work with uh, our customers in the process of things. And then values are reignited when you behavioralize each of those value words or value statements. And I put behavior behavioralize in quotations because it's not a word, but it's a word I use to try to describe, you know, this process of, you know, taking a value and creating a word picture of that behavior, you know, represented by, by the word itself. So an example can be, you know, a lot of companies will say, we want to be a company of respect. We want to be a team that respects each other. We want to be employees that value respect for one another. And, and what does respect look like in real life? It's not just an idea on the wall, but it's a behavior to live. And so to behavioralize that word means that you, um, you know, ask two simple questions. If you were gonna be a, an employee of respect, what would you always do? What would you never do? And you might say for the always do it, always I, I would listen, I wouldn't interrupt other people. I'd you know, show up at meetings on time, things like that. What would I never do? I would never, uh, you know, interrupt someone. I would never um, bring my technology to the meeting and sit on my cell phone or on my laptop and, uh, you know, do work while I'm sitting in the meeting. And, and those examples of creating some behaviors that help create a picture of what respect looks like is what behavioralizing your values is, um, is really all about. So a way to, um, reignite your culture as you behavioralize those values. Now you have pictures for everyone of what the values mean and how they're lived out as you relate to other employees and your vendors and your customers. And you reinforce that by two things, giving immediate feedback when the behavior represented by the value is ignored, or also by um, giving consistent accountability regardless of the individual. So you may be in a meeting and one of the team, your team members, one of your direct reports keeps interrupting people. He's got a proposal, but people keep challenging and bringing, you know, questions to, to his proposal. And, and he keeps interrupting any challenge to his proposal. And you realize what happens in the dynamics with the team. And so after the meeting is over, you go to uh, their office and you just say, hey, I need to give you some, some immediate feedback about what just happened in our team meeting. And uh, you know, every time anybody challenged your proposal or just asked questions or had some ideas for you, you know, you interrupted them every time. You never let anybody finish. And and what happened is, it it really took the energy out of the room. Everybody backed away. And and rather than being a productive conversation, you know, the meeting was really shut down. And my expectation for you going forward is that you would be willing to listen to your team members you know, in the midst of really discussing with you a proposal and an idea and let, you know, your team members enrich it. And what you've done in that immediate feedback is you've said, hey, this is what I have observed. Secondly, this is the impact it had on the team. And thirdly, this is my expectation for you going forward. And, and that feedback needs to also have consistent accountability where even the high performer doesn't get a pass. Everybody you know, consistently is accountable to the behaviors represented by those values. 
and uh, answering the question and looking at it from a high perspective of what we've just talked about, how, you how do you navigate employee burnout? The two perspectives are one individually, resolve the root causes of burnout, the anonymity, the irrelevance, and the measurement. And secondly, organizationally, you reignite the values that defined your culture. Behavioralize those values, give immediate feedback and consistent accountability you know, across your organization. And uh, again, it's a very different way to respond, but it's a way of navigating through all those things that can lead to burnout in the way we approach and experience our jobs. And I know at the end, we're going to have some time for questions, so I'm gonna hold off on that and take us to the second topic that I was asked to talk about in terms of offering professional development with a lack of resources. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's the CFO types that are raising questions in these days of saying, so what are we getting for all this money we're spending on professional development? And maybe now is not the time to be spending that money. So budgets are cut back and travel is uh, eliminated and conferences that we'd like to attend are either being canceled or postponed. And it's, it's almost as if, uh, you know, the, um, the professional development wallet you know, has a shoestring around it controlling the expenditure, the outflow of money to do professional development. So what I'd like to talk about are five ideas that really uh, respond to professional development on a shoestring or with limited resources. And the first three really set the stage for the last two of the big ideas, which are more of the practical, relevant parts of it. But when you talk about professional development, here's the first big idea. You know, we're really talking about knowing, doing, and being, and knowing what do you need to learn, you know, uh, about a new work skill or a work behavior that's important, uh, doing how are you working differently in light of what you're learning, and thirdly, um, who are you becoming? You know, as we develop professionally, we grow, we mature, we change, and sometimes as we think about professional development through those through lenses, we think obviously the uh, the knowing is the more important part. What do I need to learn, you know, about some new aspect of my own professional development? And there's some research that's come to us from the Center for Creative Leadership out of their 50 plus years of, uh, you know, researching and understanding how we develop, you know, leaders in organizations. And they refer to it as the 70-20-10 model. And uh, counterintuitively, rather than learning being the largest part of the model of how you're going to use time and resources, you know, in your professional development, their model has shown that really 10% of, of the model is the learning part of it. 20% is discussing how that learning applies. And 70%, really the transformative part of it is that on the job application, you know, in stretch assignments to not do more work, not do new work, but to do the work you're doing differently. So when you think about that first big idea, you could state it this way, professional development is the result of incremental learning combined with incremental application to build new and better habits of working. And that incremental is the key idea. We're not trying to do something major here. We're taking, you know, something that's manageable uh, that we can do on an incremental kind of basis, the learning and its application. And then uh, another idea that will lead us to our second big uh, conclusion on this topic comes out of the Strategic Thinking Institute, Rich Horwath's work in his first book called Deep Dive. And he said it this way, he said, business strategy is the intelligent allocation of uh, limited resources, there's that phrase, through a unique system of activity to outperform the competition in serving the customers. And if we were to take that definition and apply it not to business strategy, but to provide, to apply it to professional development, we could say it this way, you know, professional development is the intelligent allocation of limited resources through a unique system of activity to outperform the competition in serving the customer. And, and it leads us to really the second of our big ideas. And you could say it this way, as you think about that, that intelligent allocation of limited resources, it's, it's really answering the question, how do we define success in our professional development? Success is doing the most with the resources you currently have. 
So if last year you had $100,000 to spend on professional development, and this year you have 10,000, you know, you can't do the same thing you did last year. So it, it's really understanding how we define success, you know, in this time when we're uh, sorting out a lot of other issues and priorities that are getting in the way of maybe budget allocations, you know, for professional development. So the third big idea comes out of some work that was done by Search Institute up in Minneapolis. And Search Institute, uh, their tagline is healthy communities, healthy youth. They're committed to what it takes to, you know, really impact the lives of our youth in our country. And they realize, you know, if we're going to have healthy youth, they have to come out of healthy communities. And they went about their research. They're, they're a team of social PhD social researchers analyzing all kinds of data to come to some understandings of what is a healthy community. Um, and, and their counterintuitive approach to improving communities you know, it goes kind of against the grain of how we usually think. We'd usually think, well, let's figure out what the problems are in the community and then figure out how to fix those problems or eliminate those problems. But their approach was more of an appreciative inquiry approach saying, well, what, what does a healthy community look like? And what they came up with in their research was 40 developmental assets of a healthy community. And I wish I could go into detail on all those, but we don't have time for that. And, and what I want you to understand is how this applies to some of what we're thinking about in terms of professional development, you know, with limited resources available and taking one of those developmental assets and talking about how it applies. And, and one of those assets is this, it's uh, developmental relationships with important people in their lives. And, in their research about that, one the, the one of 40 developmental assets, they identified five elements of that asset and 20 action, actions that come out of those elements. And um, if, if we wanted to just boil it down to look not at all the actions, but just the elements, the elements of developmental relationships are these, expressing care, challenging growth, providing support, sharing power, and expanding uh, possibilities. And uh, again, what if we apply their research to organizational life? What if we thought about healthy organizations and healthy employees? And we just took that uh, one asset of developmental relationships and applied it to what we're talking about. You know, what might that look like? So big idea number three uh, is using your existing internal resources not hiring, not outsourcing, but using every supervisor, every manager, every leader to provide professional development through developmental relationships with their direct reports. And obviously the question comes, so how do you do that? What does that mean? What does that look like? And that takes us to the last two strategies that will become uh, big idea four and five. And one of the two strategies that um, answers the how question is to look at each of your leaders, all of your supervisors, managers, and leaders as coach. And, and it's answering the how question, how do we offer professional development on limited resources? Well, you do it by having all of those people in leadership function as coaches who are investing in building developmental relationships. And, and so I, I've got a couple of ideas of what that looks like, a couple of coaching actions. And this first one, if you, if you gain nothing more than this idea from you know, what we're talking about, this idea will be transformative in the culture of your organization. If you have you know, every person in leadership do stay interviews with their direct uh, reports. And this book you know, describes stay interviews uh, subtitle, A Manager's Guide to Keeping the Best and the Brightest. Stay interviews are, are a retention strategy, but essentially they are a leader communicating to each of their direct reports. I'm interested in more than you know, what you do in your job assignment. I'm interested in helping support and encourage and resource you know, your own you know, career planning and your career development. And, and so it's uh, a structured way to do some one-on-one -on -one conversations with each of your direct reports. And uh, if you were simply to do a Google search and, and search for stay interviews, 
One of the documents you'll find is a document uh, from SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management on stay interviews. And in just a few pages, it's a real practical article, describes what it's all about, you know, how you set it up, and just an array of questions that can be asked in that conversation. But what you're communicating to your direct report is that you're interested in more than just the job they do. You're interested in them and their career development, which may lead to their advancement in the company, may eventually lead to their leaving the company for a better job somewhere else in the process of it. Um, the second part of the coaching action, alongside doing stay interviews, is capturing those spontaneous moments, those informal conversations that really help you build your connection and really give you a way to bring accountability in your conversations with your direct reports. And I've identified nine different kinds of coaching questions that can be a part of that. And uh, you may add some better questions or some other ones, but the obvious question, do you need my help? The inquisitive question, what uh, do I need to know from you today? The awkward question, how are you keeping me informed? And I'm not gonna read through all these, but I'll take you to the last question, the stretch question, are you ready for another stretch assignment? And, and, and if you get the PowerPoint, you can uh, go through the, you know, the full list of these nine questions. But the big idea that comes from this, the leader as coach answering that how question, you know, how do we deliver professional development without you know, many resources? And the idea in the leader as coach with uh, every supervisor, every manager, every leader, is that you're investing in the development of your direct reports and uh, using those stay interviews, using those uh, spontaneous conversations to be a part of working on that. The last part of the strategy is not to see the leader as coach, but to see the leader as teacher. And if the leader as coach answers the how question, the leader as teacher answers the what question. And, and whereas all of your leaders, managers, supervisors, leaders are involved in the coaching, it, only a select group become a part of leaders as teachers answering that what question. And the first step in the leader as teacher is to identify the top three core skills or behaviors needed by uh, every member uh, or team member in the organization. And the picture there is actually a friend of mine that was taken this summer up in Minneapolis and he's a, a minister and uh, his golf game obviously leads, leaves something to be desired and he must have a high candy handicap in it, but he represents the fact that, you know, everything we do, there are skills and behaviors to be effective in doing it. And sometimes in our organizations, we can identify what are, what are the core, what are, again, thinking of being incremental in how we're addressing this topic. You know, what are three core skill behaviors, uh, skills or behaviors that every team member meet, needs? It may be collaboration, the ability to work cross-functionally, it may be in the area of conflict resolution, might be in the area of um, planning the steps from start to finish. You know, what are we trying to do? Who's responsible for it? How's it going to get done? And when is it responsible to be done? And the uh, that kind of sets you up for the second step. So if the first step is identifying those three core skills or behaviors, the second step is to build or buy an active learning experience that reflects adult learning styles to address each skill or behavior identified. And really, I've done enough search online. My guess is you can find that kind of resource without spending any money that helps you build a learning experience to address the three core skill behaviors that you identify. And the third step is to identify leaders to facilitate each of those learning experiences, which means you've got to recruit them, train them in terms of how to facilitate group process, um, have them do a pilot. And if they're not ready yet to take on a, one of the learning experiences, you know, keep developing them them further, but, you know, do some evaluation and give them some feedback as well. So there's a, a sampling of core topics that add to what I already mentioned, interviewing, effective meetings, communication, emotionally smart teams, you know, the whole area of technology. And so big idea number five is the leader as teacher. It's a select group of supervisors, managers, or leaders become the teaching team for your three core skill or behavior learning experiences. And in addition to that, you may have uh, professional learning groups. 
that meet over lunch and read, you know, read the same book together, discuss articles, podcasts, TED Talks, and you probably also have some internal subject matter experts on different topics that you can leverage and use their expertise as well. So how do you offer professional development with a lack of resources? Incremental learning and incremental application, realizing that success is doing the most with the resources you currently have available, developmental relationships with all direct reports, and then seeing every leader as coach in addressing the how you deliver that with limited resources. And then lastly, the leader as teacher, a select group that addresses what you're going to, going to you know, work on with your entire organization. So again, questions, we'll deal with at the end. That's uh, all from me and I'm out of my time. Well, thank you, Dr. Daniels. I really appreciate that presentation. Some really good tips on um, navigating burnout and also on the professional development side. Um, now we will hear from um, two executives from Fuller Blue that will talk about um, our, offering benefits and wellness that work during a pandemic, and also um, some tips for driving for inclusion while you're working remote. And to do this, like I mentioned before, we have Keith Collison. He's the Senior Director of Total Rewards. So he oversees compensation, benefits, well-being, and the Employee Contact Care Center for Florida Blue and its subsidiaries. He's an HR professional with over 30 years of experience and has been with Florida Blue and Guidewell for the last, in this role for the last three and a half years. Um, Cheryl Magavero is the Senior Director of Enterprise Talent Acquisition, and she's responsible for delivering the workforce to Florida Blue as well as other companies across the Guidewell enterprise. She's been in the Cross and Blue Shield family for 29 years. Um, in Spent nine years in customer service and 20 years in human resources. So we have um, some very experienced and very knowledgeable folks to share this with us today. So I will kick you over to Keith. Keith um, and Cheryl, thank you very much for being here and um, appreciate your time. Well, thanks. Um, I thought I'd open up by um, you know giving you a little bit of background with Florida Blue on Guidewell. Um, when the COVID epidemic hit um, and started ramping up in March, within five days, Florida Blue sent 95% of our employees home. So it started on a Monday with a multi-week plan. By the time we got to Wednesday, they said, can you be out of the office on Thursday? So they literally shifted over 8,000 employees home within a four or five day period and had all the IT system support and everything um, functioning. Yeah, there were some hiccups, but we were able to do that. So with that, um, you know, one of the things about it is we've already been told that we will not be repopulating the buildings until January at the earliest. So probably within the second quarter of 2021. So with that, they've even shut off their badges. We can't get in the buildings but it's created some new challenges, some new opportunities for us as a business. And we've really it seemed to have risen to the challenge um, in order to deliver what we need to deliver for our members and our customers. So um, a key thing about it is one of the things we learned right up front is listening to the employees. Um, we've done poll surveys practically every month with slightly different themes behind them and trying to listen to the employees about what their challenges work, were. Um, one survey was um, clearly dedicated towards remote working. How are you dealing with remote working? How are you adjusting? Things like that. And then we would address not just hearing the issues, but creating a strategic plan on how we address that going forward, which actually drove a lot of the um, health and wellness and various types of programs that we changed um, going forward. Um, with critical employees that were required to be on our campuses, um, we addressed those a little bit differently because we still had about you know, 600 or so employees that were on campus. So, um, one of the um, feedback we heard from them is there was too much traffic of people coming into the office to either print something to get documents to do work or just to i was out on a trip i wanted to come to the office so that that actually drove to shutting the offices down and restricting access because the employees that were on campus 
they were used to who they were working with. They knew how those people were operating and you know playing it safe in the COVID environment. And um, you know, you know, someone like me coming in, they don't know who I saw the day before. I was a new person in the office. Was I coming in, putting them at risk? So there was definitely a strategy on how to handle employees that were at work. You know, all the cleaning protocols. Um, if someone did come down with COVID, all the you know, how do you, how do you address it and do the um, um, sanitation of all the offices, things like that. When it came to health and wellness, some of the things that we addressed, uh, there's a long list. Um, if you look at benefits, we immediately address PTO. Um, when you have your employees going off remote, um, one of the challenges were it's like you have your kids at home, they're trying to do their schooling and share the computers. Um, we had people really um, needing time off in the day to handle personal situations. So we made our PTO more flexible to allow our employees, especially the hourly employees, the opportunity to take care of those issues. Um, we also um, allowed an extra 14 days of PTO of paid time off if you were diagnosed or you were quarantined and weren't able to do your job so that they didn't have to worry about an income stream coming in. And they could concentrate on getting healthy. Um, when it came to other things, um, and a lot of companies did this. We addressed our health insurance, um, you know, or you know, covering the COVID testing, um, you know, remote visits, um, teledoc, you know, offering free visits there to try to keep people out of the health system. Um, we also approached various um, components with the 401k. Um, relocation programs were restricted. We um, shortened the amount of time. Well, we had a lot of stress with relocating employees because they were under a time frame of 12 months. And so we're offering much more flexibility so that they could relocate once the economy started opening up. And then um, we also um, really emphasize some new programs we put in place, such as caregiver relief. Um, I think the other component, when you kind of look on the other side of it, is with the well being program. Once we started those poll surveys and we found out what the needs of employees were, we addressed them up front. It ranged from everything we're offering virtual physical fitness programs and meditation programs on a weekly basis to um, creating webinars on how to teach kids at home and how to deal with um, the home issues that the um, parents were dealing with. Um, we'll provide people ergonomic support so that they have the right office equipment at home um, or dealing with that without having to purchase much. Um, then we also even approached um, EAP, um, trying to get employees to engage in EAP because we could sense through the pulse surveys uh, heightened stress, uh, you know, fear about the unknown. How do you deal with all these stresses and issues? And um, we did have a lot of internal resources that we could use, but people weren't familiar with them. We sent them on scavenger hunts through our EAP websites. We did webinars. We did a variety of things just to get people familiar with what services that we have and that were offered that um, we could um, engage those folks in. And um, you know, there was just so much that we did with the well being, and we even currently do today in order to get people um, the resources they need that they can cope with the stress and the mental health well being issues that they're dealing with today. Um, we aren't all the way there. We're continuing to have these challenges, just as any other company is having. Um, we're trying to stay on the front, you know, edge of that and trying to address it. Um, we'll be doing different things during our annual benefits enrollment for 2021. You know, we got several things in the works that um, based on the recent feedback surveys that can be addressed as we approach the fall. Cheryl, do you want to address some of the inclusion? Yes, thank you. Um, that was a really good summary, Keith, so thank you. Um, I actually want to ju just jump back for a minute when um, Dr. Daniels was talking about um, some of the burnout because much of many of the strategies that we've employed are um, directly aligned to that. So Keith mentioned a lot of the things that we've done in terms of benefits and um, and helping employees. And the um, the one item that we were talking about was even people being present and and how um, 
we were meeting the needs so that they could be with their family, they could be with their children, helping with the schooling. And we did, there were a couple different things that we did in terms of even adjusting meeting times in terms of the duration so that people were intentionally given time in between rounds to take a break and take care of the things they needed to. Um, and then also with the um, burnout, I think, you know, just to really amplify some of the things that Keith was talking about, um, and it really does lend itself to inclusion as well. We were very, uh, we, we were and we continue to be very intentional about hearing the voice of the employee. So rather than waiting for people to come forward, we are um, actively engaging the workforce in a very proactive way, whether it's with a pulse survey, an employee engagement survey. Um, we have our senior leaders at company doing blog sessions where you know everybody can join they can bring their questions forward um, and one of the things that I'm really proud of that the company does is it's not just a matter of hosting the sessions but you see the activities and the following that comes from that so we do hear the concerns of the employees um, very early on when we first went home in March um, it was when the communities were really uh, I don't want to say lockdown, but we were much more uh, at home, much less uh, movement outside of the home. And people had concerns about grocery stores and all of those things. And um, in response to that, what we did is we employed our food service vendor um, because we didn't have people on campus, you know, buying the food. So we we um, kept them employed also by preparing meals that employees could order. They would drive up, it would be loaded in their car. We had all of the basic staple groceries that they can order and get from us. So that they were also, um, we were responding to the fears that they had in terms of going in the community. So we really did a lot of things that um, addressed the whole person and not just, you know, the hours of eight to five. But um, as Keith said, making sure that we were caring for the individuals, for their families. Um, you know, when we learned that there was a family member that Sick. We had care packages that were sent out. Um, you know, so all of those things I think were very positive. And, and again, aligned also to us helping our communities by keeping um, the food service workers employed as well. And um, we even got to a point where we were doing meal prep um, to go out to some of the community agencies also, uh, which was right in line with, with our mission and who we are as a company. Um, the other things in terms of um, inclusion, we have really transitioned quickly uh, to technology, to using technology such as this, uh, these types of meetings, so that when we are uh, working with our teams or groups of people, we can observe and we see the body language and we strive for inclusion and making sure that everybody has an opportunity to um, contribute. And um, I think we've been very effective in doing that. Um, it's a transition, but we've all gotten pretty comfortable with it, and um, and we continue to do that. So um, you know, I have found those to be very uh, helpful for the workforce. Um, and then most recently, um, so I uh, have accountability for the talent acquisition team, and our um, customer is any candidate who comes forward. So we've even employed some listening uh, programs for the candidates that come to us so that we can understand what they're looking for in an employer, how we're responding to that, um, and treating them with the same level of respect that we would anybody who is employed because they're potential employees, customers. Um, so really just taking kind of a broad view uh, at, at making sure that everybody's needs are met. That's great. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the other piece that I just wanted to touch on was around the development. Um, Dr. Daniels also talked about that as well. And um, we have a practice in our company uh, right now that's being rolled out. It, it's not to everybody at this point. But we are also looking and doing 60 evaluation so that we can um, help individuals identify where there are opportunities for growth and development. And I love that you pointed out 70% is on the uh, 
the experiential or the stretch assignments because that's where um, we're really starting to hone in our learning uh, for individuals as they seek for development and growth opportunities. So very much in line with what we're doing now. Yeah, I think another point Dr. Daniels made, uh, I wrote a note about um, when you were talking about the values, um, about that it's more than just ideas to believe in or behaviors. Uh, it's behaviors to live, how we live by it. And I, I can tell you, just as an employee of Florida Blue and Guidewell, I've heard from my team as well as myself to really see the company go out and listen to folks or see what the community needs and deliver on it and actually take action um, makes you really feel good about the company. And it's really shown through in our employee engagement survey in just a short period of time. Um, I think um, it was very noticeable uh, results behind it. Would you agree, Cheryl? Yeah, and um, I think that's one of the best, one of many, many proud moments that I can say we have right now. This is an incredibly challenging time, and, and we all talk to others who have their own experiences with um, their employers. And I think through the efforts that we've had with keeping the needs of the workforce um, front and center and, and really addressing them, and the way that we have shown up with um, not just our workforce, but with the community. What we see, and um, there's actually a meeting that's happening right now, and Keith and I will get the update after, but um, we do an annual employee engagement survey, and it looks like there was a significant movement in the level of engagement. So I think the, the message there is if you're listening and you're responding, people will be more engaged. And mm. The values that we have and how we intend to treat the workforce really came through. In times of trouble, that's when we learn. Um, and it goes one of two ways. And I'm really excited to see what the responses were because I think by being present and being that, um, I don't want to say the choice employer, but being an employer that is doing the right thing for the employees, um, the level of engagement that is gained is, is you know, there's a business value to that as well, which equates to productivity and the, um, the commitment to the organization. So those things are very, very positive. Um, you know, and I say if there is a silver lining in all of this, it's, it's really what we're seeing. That's great. Well, thanks, uh, Keith and Cheryl, for, for providing um, a little bit of update as to what, what Florida Blue and Godwell are doing. And I just want to get to a couple questions here. And this is something that never, that all three of you have really touched on. Um, but if you look at it from an, from an employee perspective, um, how important do you all think it is um, as a retention tool how employer how employees believe that they've been treated by their employers over the last six months through the pandemic i think it's huge um and you know as i said when you see the the level of engagement go up as, as much as we are seeing that in and of itself is, is evidence, um, and people are being very expressive about, um, you know, how they feel about being part of the organization. It has really, um, I think, from a state perspective, I think it's just really reinforced it. Um, now, part of my job is on the kind of the sales side, right? Because we're talking to candidates and getting them to join the organization, and these are all of the positive things that we do share. Um, how the employer cares for, uh, you know, the, the workforce. Um, so I think from a state perspective, I think this has been very powerful for us. And I'll, I'll jump in on that. I think six months ago, we were in a very different job climate where when people wrestled with that question, if they didn't like what they were experiencing, they were apt to think about uh, jumping ship and going somewhere else. I think now the you know the companies really have employees somewhat over a barrel of being a little apprehensive about you know either assuming their job is indefinite is indefinite or um, you know the opportunity to look elsewhere you know we might get to that point but you know right now I think people are glad they have the jobs they have so even if they're wrestling with the answer to that question they're probably living with that frustration. And you know, to your point, Dr. Daniels, do you think when when things do pick up, 
you know, in the over the next few months or year or, or you know, maybe sooner. When people are looking for that next opportunity, do you think they'll ask more questions about their their employer and kind of you know if that's a place where they want to be? Do you think that that then they maybe have a little bit more power I, in the negotiation? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I look at my own career path and, you know, those that I have coached even across the state, I think every time you make a job transition, you become a bit more intentional in understanding, you know, uh, who am I reporting to? What's their reputation? You know, what are the values of the organization and do they square with my values? You know, is this a good fit for me? And I think people are more willing further in their career to be more selective if they have you know, that possibility to be more selective. Um, so I think early early career, you just take what comes to some degree. But, you know, as you go through your career run, I think you get more intentional in asking all those, you know, uh, doing your due diligence in terms of saying, is this the best job I can find? And um, this is probably for, for Cheryl and Keith. When you mentioned that you guys were doing a lot of pulse surveys with employees. Was there anything that came up that you thought, man, I'm glad we asked because we didn't even think about that being an issue? Um, I, I think for each survey, something came out of the surveys. And we intend, we have a group that did the survey and they intentionally looked at a slightly different topic each time they went out. Um, so like the first survey was um, the transition to working remote to, um, you know, then it came to mental health and well-being and various other components. It just evolved over about three or four months. And um, things came out of it. And pretty much every survey, there were these aha moments. And you saw action being taken very quickly. Um, several of these programs I talk about here were as a result of some of that action, um, especially on the well-being side, because um, we had people asking for help with um, office equipment. They didn't have the right chairs and things like that. Well, we were clearing out chairs at work based on the office remodel, and we actually offered those chairs to employees if they needed them. Um, you know, we did various things like that that were almost immediate actions. So every time we had a survey within like three days, there was a public posting of what the results were and what action was being taken. And it was up there, the CEO presenting all that. It wasn't a director, it wasn't a VP. It was the CEO was presenting it saying these were the types of actions being taken. Hmm. And what, what's really um, powerful and impactful is um, not only the CEO taking the action, but being um, in front of the entire workforce on a pretty regular basis, almost weekly, and saying, I heard you, and here's what we're doing. Um, so it wasn't something that just happened, but people truly felt valued um, because of that. Mm -hmm. And for me, there were um, a few that I was a little bit surprised at the enormity of the issue, and it was with um, with childcare and people feeling, you know, mm -hmm. um, kind of aligned to their desk and they couldn't care for the family and the kids were home. And, you know, as Keith said early on, the swift action to say, we're going to give you an allotment of time for you to take when you need it throughout the day. Um, that was very powerful. And then the other piece was, um, you know, we've been, we've been fortunate and we haven't had any reductions in force with our, mm -hmm. uh, with our company. Yeah. So one makes an assumption that people are working and everything is kind of static. Well, but there are, you know, impacts with spouses and parents or other family members that are impacted. So even from a financial perspective, um, we we really dug deep and leveraged some of the benefits that we have that can help employees um, and even had some campaigns to do some additional um, efforts that, that yielded a financial benefit for uh, those that needed it. And and I knew uh, Dick, this is or Dr. Dan, this is one of the things that you talked about a lot. Um, but we've talked about employee engagement, and we've talked about professional development. Um, in this time, are there some forms of professional development that you've seen that can really help drive employee engagement at the same time? To really well, take care I of think, yeah, I think that stay interview format really um, contributes to both the employee experience and employee engagement. 
because it's it's what what I have seen and experienced is a lot of people are not very intentional about their career planning. You know, they're in a job, and you know, if another job comes, they may consider to take it or pursue another job. But actually thinking about development of I'm at this level, what are the, the competencies or behaviors that are needed for me to be functioning at the next level up the hierarchy? Um, to have somebody that is your, is your boss that you're reporting to who is uh, making it a safe place for you to have those conversations and really is encouraging you and, and willing to resource and support you in that journey. Um, I, think, I think cultures that are like that um, you know, are, are attractive to the best talent in the industry. And, and when you experience that and you realize that it's somewhat rare, it makes you think twice about, you know, leaving uh, just because the grass might look greener on the other side of the fence somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, I can speak to that too, because um, Dr. Daniels made a good point and I know Cheryl will back me up on this. Um, I, I have two or three managers and we definitely have discussions about career development, their next step. But um, I know I do and I know Cheryl does. We actually do skip level meetings with the, all the employees two or three levels down and talk about their development and what their career objectives are, really trying to encourage them to um, engage in that because we offer those sources. But um, I don't want it to be quiet and just everybody sitting around waiting, but actually engaging in those discussions up front. And I, you know, it has to be part of the culture. It has to be part of the environment in order to make it work. Yeah. Good, We're really good, good about um, um, setting those expectations. And, and we also measure those things because they do matter. Um, so we look and we, we monitor the, um, the movement employees have within the organization. And just from a availability of jobs, when, when roles become open in the organization, more than 50% of the time, somebody internally selected because they have mm -hmm. developed and they're prepared for that job. Right. So, you know, it's, um, it's still hiring, but, but it's great when you see that people can't progress. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that opens up different roles where we may have folks from the outside um, from the community of flying, but, but we do have a very high uh, level of internal mobility, which, you know, again, goes to engagement and reinforces the development and such. And one, I know that um, you've all talked about engaging employees and, and making sure we're communicating with employees. How, how is it, um, how do you best recommend trying to identify an employee that may be getting burned out, that may not be, um, you know, in using a lot of the engagement tools, but how, how does a manager kind of pick up on that? I think sometimes it's, um, you know, it's, it could be a very passive behavior that, that you just need to be um, aware of. Uh, one of the things that we do within the larger uh, team that I work with is the leader does uh, four questions at the beginning of the meeting. Are you thriving? Are you just surviving? I forget what four categories are. Um, but he also shares the results and then encourages people to come forward. So if you have trust with your workforce, they will come forward and, and share the struggles that they're having. Um, you know, but you have to build that trust. You can't just ask the questions and, and expect people will be completely vulnerable and open up. So, you know, you, you have to build up to it. But I think if you're consistent, um, and, and you even, uh, Dr. Daniel said something about being vulnerable and asking those questions, um, you can get there. But you do have to pay attention um, yeah. when people withdraw. I, I would agree. I, I wrote a little piece a while ago called the emotional flow of employee disengagement. And and it's the employee that, you know, is on board, thinks they work in Disney World, and why would somebody pay them to do what they're doing? They're just the engaged employee. And they begin to see some of the issues that might exist, or they have issues in their own life, and they move to a point of confusion of thinking, I thought this was Disney World, and it's not. And the confusion leads to frustration, and the frustration becomes being cynical um, and skeptical. And eventually, potentially, some become those toxic employees that are really trying to disengage every other employee. 
And I think it's just watching for it, it, you know, what, what was just said in terms of you have to pay attention, you know, it is paying attention and observing, you know, what, what are their attitudes and behaviors like? What are you hearing from, you know, others? Not that you want to go on secondhand information, but, you know, when you see that there are changes of attitudes or they have moved from their, their exceeding expectations, now they're only meeting expectations, or maybe now occasionally they're not meeting expectations. I think some of those things are the signs of, you know, uh, again, indicating that maybe this person is headed towards burnout. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you guys very much. We have uh, reached the end of the, the webinar today. Um, I want to really thank our panel for um, taking the time to share this great insight with our members. Uh, Dr. Dick Daniels with Right Management, Keith Collison and Cheryl Magavero from Florida Blue and Guidewell. Um, just as a reminder, if you had to miss any portion of this one, or if you missed any of the previous webinars in our series, um, they are available on the at our the Jax Chambers COVID-19 Business Resource <clears throat> site. Uh, we record all of those there. We will have another episode on uh, next Tuesday at two o'clock uh, regarding cybersecurity in their remote work environment. So again, thank you very much to our panelists and um, everyone have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.